Okay, let's see now how we can start to understand some algebraic concepts in Rn. Let's start with just vector addition here. Right, we're familiar with this con, excuse me, we're familiar with this concept because we're familiar with matrix addition, right? Really, again, a vector V, if it's given by a column vector, V1 through Vn, well, this is really just an n by one matrix, right? And so the properties of vector addition just boil down to the properties of matrix addition. But to be explicit and to really emphasize the algebra in Rn, we do need to kind of look at vector addition on its own. Okay, let's say we have another vector here. Um, so we have this V and then out of order, order, all right, U here is U1 all the way through UN here. And so what do we mean by their sum U plus V, right? Well, this is the sum of two vectors, which we're pretty used to. Um, so here's V1 through Vn, right? So this is U plus V. And the vector addition is defined by, you pass from the addition of vectors to, so like the sum of the components to the components of the sum, right? And so we have here a component of the sum for the first one. So we have u1 plus v1. We would have u2 plus v2, et cetera, et cetera, un plus vn, right? And just to be more explicit, this would be u plus v if you'd like a definition, right? Boxed in red here would be your quote unquote definition of vector addition. Let's see an example. Let's look in R4 here. In R4, let's say we have the following vectors. So we have U, which is the vector um, two, three, four, five. Transpose, and then V is the vector one, zero, negative three, one. Transpose. Well, then what would U plus V look like? U plus V would then be two, three, four, five, transpose plus one, zero, negative three, one, transpose. And the vector addition here would say we have two plus one in the first component, three plus zero in the second component, four minus three in the third component, and then five plus one in the second component, which means U plus V would give us the vector three, three, one, six, transpose, or if you'd like, that's three, three, one, six, right? And so there's a, a quick example of uh, vector addition in R4. Remember, we have some properties of matrix addition. And so we have these properties of vector addition as well. Let's look at these for uh, the sake of completion. So these are properties of vector addition, right? We have that vector addition is commutative. We have that it's associative. We have that there exists identity element. So there exists an additive identity. And we also have that there exists an additive inverse, right? We've talked about identity and inverse elements previously. So let's recall what these properties are saying. If something's commutative, that means the order is um, irrelevant. Not that it's irrelevant, but it doesn't matter which order you compute the sum in, you're going to get the same thing. Associative means the order in which you compute sums doesn't matter. So if we had, say, vectors like u, v, and w, well, if we did u plus v first and then added this to the vector w, that would be the same as first doing v plus w and then adding u. Right, so we have this associativity condition or property that's satisfied. Remember the additive identity is something that when you add a vector to this identity, you get the same vector back. Well, that would be the zero vector, right? So the, the additive identity is zero, which is just zeros, zero, right? And if you had u plus zero, you would just get u, 
right? We also have an additive inverse, and that would be negative u, which is the vector negative u1 through negative un. And you can see that if you took u plus negative u, you would get zero, right? And so remember the additive inverse is something that when you add it to the original vector, you get the identity element. And that's exactly what we have here with, with negative u. Okay, so here's some properties of our vector addition. Let's understand now the geometry of vector addition. Okay, the first thing I wanna say is the zero vector is represented as just a point, right? Because there's no direction and there's no magnitude. So we'll refer to the zero vector as just a point. Um, if we have though, for non-trivial vectors, let's say we have u and v two vectors. So we have u here, and then let's just make up some, say there's v, okay? And we wanna understand what u plus v is. Well, u plus v is obtained as follows. You take u, you take a copy of u, and then you take v, and you move it so that the initial point of v is the end point or the terminal point of u, and you make these the same point. And so if we did that, then we have a copy of u where the base point or excuse me, we have a copy of V where the base point is the same as the end point of U, right? And so once you take V and move it to the end of vector U, then you look at what would complete this triangle here. This vector starting at U, ending at V is the vector u plus v. And we could verify one of these properties really quickly. What if we did v plus u? So if we did v plus u, well, let's take a copy of v first. And then remember, now we're going to take the end of u, or the beginning of u, and place it at the end of v, right? So if we do that, we're getting u. And then what would v plus u be? It would be the vector starting at v and ending at u. And you can notice, I mean, I didn't draw this perfectly, but these are the same vector, right? It's just a parallel transport of the same vector. And we call those vectors equivalent, right? So here we can verify the commutative property of addition purely by a geometric argument. Um, let's see what else we want to do here. We can talk about the subtraction of vectors um, as well. And let's understand the subtraction of vectors by from a geometric standpoint, right? If we had, so here's for subtraction. We know that if we had like u and v, u minus v is understood to be u plus negative v. Right, And so how we can understand this is, or another way to understand this would be like u1 minus v1, et cetera, et cetera, un minus vn, right? In explicit coordinates there. Um, basically what we would be doing is, well, if you have a vector v, the vector negative v is a vector of the same magnitude, meaning the length of the vector is the same, but it's in the opposite direction, right? So you, you rotate by pi degrees or 180 degrees, and you go from V to negative V and the length of V and negative V are the same. And so how would we understand the geometry of U minus V? Well, let's use the same U and V here, right? So we have, um, this u and then v, the v we were working with was doing that. So maybe let me call this one over here w just so we're not confused, right? So this was just to show what would negative of a vector look like. 
So here we have u and v. Well, this means negative v is going to be of the same magnitude, but in the opposite direction. And then if we understand vector subtraction as u plus negative v, well, then we just take a copy of u. Sorry, that's not the best copy, right? That isn't either, but you get the idea. We take a copy of u, and then we take a copy of negative v instead of positive v. And then we get the resulting vector here, starting at u, ending at negative v, u minus v. And subtraction isn't commutative, right? Um, because that order matters. So u minus v is not the same as v minus u. Um, but here's just an idea of, of u minus v. Okay, and we've, we've also now understood the geometry of this vector addition and vector subtraction. So what about scalar multiplication? For scalar multiplication, we have, let's say we have a vector u that's given by u1 through un here, okay? And let's let k be a real number. Well, then the scalar multiple of a vector u is given by ku, um, which is a significantly less, um, less superior college to ksu, of course. But um, So we have ku here. This is defined as k times u1, un. And this would be defined as you multiply each component by k. So we have ku1, ku2, kun, right? And so this is an example of a scalar multiple. You know, let's do another four-dimensional example, just like we did in uh, for vector addition. If we had v is the vector um, 1, 0, negative 1, 2, well then, and if we let k be 3, then what would 3v become, right? 3v would then be 3 times 1, 0, negative 1, 2, which is 3, 0, negative 3, 6, right? And so this idea of scalar multiplication, hopefully, uh, is not too foreign because we've been using this for, for matrices. Right, and we use this for vectors in Calc 3, again, if you took Calc 3, or if you have taken it yet. What's the geometric interpretation of scalar multiplication? Well, um, I'm getting, uh, okay, let's, let's look at the geometry of scalar multiplication here, and then maybe we can talk about some property. Uh, just kidding, let's do properties first. I'm indecisive. Let's do properties, and this is of scalar multiplication. Okay. Well, we have that it distributes over vector addition. We have that it distributes over scalar multiplication. We have that it's associative. We have um, also a multiplicative. So let's see, let's say there exists a multiplicative identity. Okay, so let's see what these mean. If, if scalar multiplication distributes over vector addition, what that means is we'll have like some scalar k and then we have vector addition here, u plus v. And if it distributes, that means that this product, the scalar product then applies uh, term by term, right? And so we have ku plus kv. If it distributes over k, uh, scalar multiplication, um, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. It doesn't distribute over itself. It distributes over scalar addition, right? Because now if you take the sum of two scalars, let's say k and I don't know where p came from, let's say k and l, and you want to scale a vector by the sum of these two scalars, 
well, then this is K U plus L U. And so basically in this way, you could think about the vector as being is what's distributing, um, but the scalar multiplication is still distributive in any case. Associativity means if you had, maybe first we had some scalar, some scaled vector L times U, and then we wanted to scale that scaled vector by some number K. Well, we could first just take the scalar product KL and then scale U by the product. And for the multiplicative identity, we know that one times U is just U here, okay? Cool, let's now look at the geometry of scalar multiplication. Okay, so for the geometry of scalar multiplication, if this has length, some length, so U is going to have length denoted by, or let's say V. I like V better here for this context, and we'll see why in a little bit. So we'll denote this as kind of like the double absolute value here of V. This is referred to as the magnitude of the vector. Okay, so we have length V here. Well, then KV is a vector with length, imagine, k times the length of v. So that's why it's called scalar multiplication is because we're scaling vectors, right? So this is a vector with length k v in the, and this is same, well, let's see, in the same or opposite, direction as V. Same is when K is greater than zero and the opposite direction is when K is less than zero, right? So for example, let's do a few examples. Let's consider the vector V here. When K equals negative one, we know we have the vector negative V. This gave us a vector of the same magnitude, but in the opposite direction. And so if we were to do something like K equals negative two, well, this is double the length, but in the opposite direction, right? So this would be say like double the length, sorry for the squiggly. So this would be negative two V, or you know maybe you want something shorter like one fourth V. But this now here, k is one fourth. And since k is greater than zero, um, the vector is pointing in the same direction, right? And so kind of et cetera, et cetera here. And this would be an example for the geometric understanding of uh, scalar multiplication. We also have that we can juxtapose these, these geometric ideas to get us um, to where we can start to understand like linear combinations of vectors. So let's, let's look at another example here um, for the geometry. Let's say we have a vector u and a vector v like this. We can understand, like let's say we wanted to calculate u plus v. Okay, how would we calculate u plus v? Well, we know that we would take a copy of u and then we take the copy of V, but placed at the end of U. And then we look at the resulting vector starting at U, ending at V, right? This is U plus V. But let's say we wanted to calculate 3U minus 2V. So how would we do that, right? Well, first, let's take U and understand what the vector 3U would be doing. Well, first, 3U would be the vector U but three times as long. So humor me in, in picturing that this is three times as long, right? And then 2v, what would 2v look like? Well, we have a copy of v there. So let's say 
2v here. So we're solving 3u minus 2v. But to do that, we need to kind of calculate these scalar multiples first. Right, so we have 3u and then 2v would be something like this, right? Like double the length of v and in the same direction as v. So that's 2v. But then we want 3u minus 2v. So really what we need to be computing is negative 2v. And negative 2v is two times the length of v, but in the opposite direction, right? And then so 3u minus 2v, we would be taking 3u plus negative 2v, the resulting vector here would be 3u minus 2v. And so we can start to understand linear combinations of vectors purely from a geometric standpoint. Of course, there is um, an algebraic um, understanding here, right? Like if you had so let's keep this picture in mind. This gives us a description of the vector. But in coordinates, or like in explicit component form, we could write 3u minus 2v as 3, like u1, un, minus 2 times v1 through vn, right? Which this would then give you 3u1 minus 2v1 et cetera, et cetera, 3un minus 2vn. So we can also understand this, you know, it's two sides of the same coin here, whether you're understanding the geometric interpretation or the algebraic interpretation, both have their benefits. And it's, it's important that you understand how to obtain certain vectors in both ways, right? By a geometric argument or by an algebraic argument, like, like we've seen here. Um, certainly for, for computations, you're going to have to do something like this, right? Like if you're taking the dot product of two vectors or the cross product of two vectors, well, there are geometric understandings to that too, but to get the explicit product, right, you'll, you'll have to crunch the numbers and, and see what, see what we get here. Okay. We've talked about now, um, scalar multiplication and um, I've I've talked about I've defined but I haven't really rigorously defined um, the magnitude of a vector so let's look at the magnitude of a vector okay so we know this represents the length of a vector. So if we have a vector v here, and let's say v is given in coordinates by v1, v2, vn transpose here, well, then how do we define the magnitude of v? The magnitude of v is defined to be the square root of the sum of the components squared. So like v1 squared plus v2 squared plus et cetera, et cetera, plus v n squared. This is the definition of the magnitude of a vector, okay? And so this is how you can explicitly calculate the length of some vector. Well, you have to know all the components. You square the components, sum it up, take the square root, whatever number that is gives you the length of the vector. So for example, if we had, let's look at an R4 example. Um, this is kind of the next, right? We've discovered where we went through plenty of two and three dimensional examples in Calc 3. And now kind of, for examples, R4 is kind of the, the next uh, logical step to start considering examples. So let's say we have um, two points P and P is given by one, two, negative four, six, and Q is given by two, three, negative one, zero. And you can ask, what is the distance between these two points, right? Like what is the linear distance or the distance of the shortest path between P 
and Q. Okay, and so this is our question. How do we solve this? Well, one way to solve this, there's plenty of ways. One way to solve this would be to construct a vector from P to Q and then find the magnitude of that vector. So let's do that, right? P, Q, we know this is going to be the vector two minus one, three minus two, negative one minus negative four, and zero minus six transpose, which this is the vector one, one, it looks like we're gonna have negative one plus four. So three, negative six, transpose, right? Then what we're doing, if this is PQ, then what is the magnitude of the vector PQ, right? Well, we take the square root of the sum of the components squared. The first component is one, so one squared. The second component was one. The third component was positive three, sorry. So let's do positive three squared and then plus negative six squared, if I'm not mistaken, right. And so let's just do some algebra. So we have two plus nine plus 36. It's gonna be 38 plus nine. That looks like it's going to be root 47. And so the length or the distance between point P and Q which is the same as the length of the vector starting at P and ending at Q is calculated to be square root 47. Okay, and what you may have discovered or kind of subconsciously understood in this example is that the magnitude is a fancy way of writing the distance formula between two points, right? We just calculated the distance between two points. And so we have, let's look for, in general, for P equals P1 through Pn, and Q equals Q1 through Qn, let's try to understand the distance between P and Q, right? Well, that's the magnitude of the vector PQ, which is root, and then Q1 minus P1 quantity squared plus et cetera, et cetera down to um, Qn or up to Qn minus Pn quantity squared. This formula here generalizes to what's known as the distance formula. So let's give a definition. The distance formula is given by, and we'll denote this as the distance between P and Q, okay? So it's, it's a very intuitive um, notation here. The D, it's the distance between P and Q. This is defined to be the square root of the sum where I goes from one to N of the absolute value of PI minus QI, whoops, absolute value quantity squared. And you can see this distance formula here is just a generalization of this magnitude formula here. Um, I've slapped in the absolute value here because we get some nice properties. We get properties of the distance formula or the distance function, right? This would be a function. You put in points and it spits out a distance. Um, so properties of the distance for formula here, or of this function, is that the distance from P to Q is thankfully the distance from Q to P. Um, our spaces would be pretty convoluted if that didn't necessarily hold. Um, and there are spaces that exist where, where you don't have a distance formula because something like this wouldn't hold. They're called non-metrizable spaces. If you're interested in those kinds of spaces, um, you can look up Maybe I'll just say here, only holds in metric spaces. Interestingly, and we'll only deal with metric spaces. Euclidean space is absolutely, it's like the best metric space you could, could ask for. Um, if you're interested in the case where you can't even define a distance formula, well, you should see non-metrizable, spaces. 
maybe Google it or something if you're interested in a space where distance isn't preserved. Not only is it not preserved, it's not defined. Um, so like not only would this property not hold, but this formula it wouldn't exist, right? For certain spaces. Um, okay, whoops. Another property we have here is that the distance between two points is always non-negative with equality, i.e. D of PQ equals zero, if and only if um, P is the same point as Q, right? So it's saying the distance between two points is non-zero unless they're the same point. So these are two properties we have that seem very trivial, um, but they're necessary, right? It's, it's necessary to, to describe this. All right, I wanna wrap up the uh, Monday's lecture here with a discussion of unit vectors. We looked at the standard normal unit vectors, but in general, you can have unit vectors in any directions, not just the three coordinate directions in R3, right? So let's start with a definition here. A vector, okay, a vector U is a unit vector if it's a vector with magnitude equal to one. So any vector that has magnitude one, we call a unit vector, right? And magnitude one, meaning I E, it has length one, or we sometimes say unit length. Okay, so this is the idea of a unit vector. It's a uh, pretty, pretty standard uh, concept. It's just if you take the magnitude of a vector, see that it happens to be one, then it's a unit vector. But it need not be so kind of nebulous, right? You can construct unit vectors rather easily. So let's say we have a vector v given by v1, v2 through vn, right? Then the magnitude of v is given by root v1 squared plus v2 squared plus et cetera, et cetera, plus vn squared, not vnz, vn2. So we say a unit vector in the same direction as v is given by and we'll say u is equal to one over the magnitude of v times v. And so we're taking this vector v and we're basically scaling it by its magnitude. Well, if you take something of a, a given length and divide by that length, you're gonna have some number over the same number, which always simplifies to one, right? So that means this will always have magnitude one. And so, you would have something like V here, and then uh, you would scale it back to length one by one over its magnitude. So this would be U equals V over magnitude of V, okay? And so this is how we construct unit vectors in any direction. You just pick a vector in a given direction, and then you scale it by one over its magnitude, and that gets you something, um, of length one in the direction that you want. If you'd like to see this in coordinates or explicitly in components, you know, you'd get like V1 over root V1 squared plus V2 squared plus et cetera, et cetera, plus Vn squared all the way down to like Vn over square root V1 squared plus et cetera, et cetera, plus Vn squared, right? So in components, it would look kind of messy but I would just calculate the magnitude first and then scale your vector V by one over the magnitude. So let's do that in a quick example and then we'll wrap up the video for, for today. So let's look at an example here. Let's look in R3. Let's say we have the vector V is given by one, negative three, four, and we want a unit vector in the direction of v, All right? So what do we do? Well, first let's calculate the magnitude of v. 
This is given by root one squared plus negative three squared plus four squared, which looks like we're going to have root 16 plus nine plus one. That looks like it's gonna be root 26, right? Because 16 plus nine would be 25 and then plus one root 26. And then u is going to be one over root 26 times one, negative three, four, which would give us the vector one over root 26, negative three over root 26, and four over root 26. So this gives us a unit vector in the same direction as V, right? And now how can we verify that this indeed has magnitude one? And you wouldn't always have to do this, but let's verify that you, that the magnitude of u equals one, okay? So let's look at our components here. The magnitude of u is gonna be square root, and then it's one over root 26 quantity squared plus negative three over root 26 quantity squared plus four over root 26 quantity squared. This is going to be one over 26 plus nine over 26 plus 16 over 26, which gives us 26 over 26, which is root one, which is just one, right? And so indeed this does have unit length just to verify um, in this example. Again, if you were to, to be asked to find a unit vector in the direction of V, you could have stopped here, right? And it would be correct assuming your, your computations were correct here and here. Um, but just for a first example, and I, I wanted to, to verify, um, wanted to, to verify that this does give you something of unit length. Okay, and then, so where we're going from here, so next is we're gonna talk about parametric lines. And we'll get into like dot product, not pot product. How about dot product, um, cross product, et cetera, et cetera, right? We've seen all of these notions in like two dimensions and three dimensions um, when you're talking like in Calc 3, right? But now we want to generalize these. So these will be generalized to Rn. Right, and so this is kind of where we'll go from here. Hopefully this was um, a, a decent and thorough introduction into working in, um, well, what is in-dimensional space and how do we understand algebra and geometry in this in-dimensional space? And now hopefully that we have a good grasp of that, we'll start to um, explore some more concepts, um, maybe a, a little bit increased difficulty, especially once we start to get to cross product and stuff like that. But for now, here was hopefully a, a pretty sufficient introduction to working in in-dimensional space.